Many a good story begins with a murder. This is one of those stories. Unfortunately, this story involves four murders. And I hardly ever throw a mugshot up on the screen, but this time I need you to see this guy. This is the face of Tsutomo Miyataki. This is the face of the guy who murdered four very young girls. And given the truly barbaric nature of his crimes, you won't be surprised to learn that the details of his case were first used by the Japanese media to get ratings then used by Japanese moralists to crusade against cartoons, and are now being used by American politicians to eviscerate your freedoms of speech and artistic expression. Between August 1988 and June 1989, Miyazaki abducted four girls between the ages of four and seven. I'm skipping over quite a few details even when I say that he strangled each one of them to death in his car, cut them into pieces, ate parts of them, and only then sexually molested them. Shortly after his fourth murder, Miyazaki met a young girl in a local public park and convinced her to take off all her clothes. He was in the process of photographing the naked girl when her father came looking for her. Now, the police arrived quickly enough and took Miyazaki into custody. But when the police searched his apartment, they discovered 5,763 videos. But don't jump to any conclusions. These weren't pornographic films. The vast majority of them were good old horror and slash studio films. Mixed among them, of course, were videos and pictures of his victims. But what garnered most of the attention of the media were a few videos of the Japanese cartoon style called anime. You can imagine the outcry following the murders of four young girls in a country in which violent crime is still rather rare. However, the news media, in the way that news media all over the world do, latched onto the idea that these violent fantasy world anime cartoons had led this man to commit these real world crimes, all but ignoring the thousands of regular studio horror films with real actors. No surprise then either that do-gooder activists began decrying anime cartoons as tools of the devil, so to speak, in the same fashion that American activists would crusade against violent video games. The argument was, of course, that violent anime cartoons were encouraging kids to commit horrific acts of violence, even though there was no evidence supporting this theory. Since we've now brought Japanese cartoons into the conversation, let's define exactly what we mean by Japanese cartoons. In no way, shape, or form do I claim to be an expert in the area of this type of art, but I have done a little bit of research. Within Japan, anime refers to serialized cartoons in general. And this form of art is said to date back to at least the 12th century. It began appealing to the masses around 1945 with the appearance of Astro Boy. Today, you see it everywhere. And while you'll hear the word manga, that word is primarily used outside of Japan. Anyway, as with any other art form or style, there are subgenres. And one of those subgenres is Lolicon. These are cartoons which focus on young girls as their main characters. They are not necessarily pornographic cartoons, but those do exist as well. However, we must be very careful to note that in the Japanese culture, Lolicon cartoons are distinctly and intentionally separated from reality. This genre focusing on young girls became popular in the 1970s, but the 1980s saw a boom not just in the popularity, but in the quality as well. 1981 saw the publication of Lemon People. 1982 gave the world Buriko, in which girl characters began to act or dress in an intentionally cute way. This was followed by Manga Hot Milk. During this time, significant artists began to make names for themselves in this developing artistic field. Kyoko Okazaki, Erika Takurazawa, and Aki Uchiyama. And it seems to be that just as this art form was reaching new heights, the artists were 
effectively being accused by the media and do-gooders of encouraging rape and murder because, and you'll guess it, a few manga videos were found in the apartment of the man arrested for murdering and then raping four young girls. That these manga videos comprised only a tiny fraction of the real-world horror and slasher films made by studios which were also found in his apartment was completely beside the point for the moralists who had taken up this banner. And although the moralists ranted and raved, it took nearly 10 years before Japanese politicians finally took action. And this might come as much of a shock to you as it did to me. In 1999, Japan passed a law criminalizing the production and distribution of child pornography. That's right. Before 1999, it was completely legal to manufacture and distribute child pornography in Japan. Take note here. They did not criminalize the possession of it, merely the manufacture and distribution. And they did not criminalize the manga depictions of child pornography that were you know, being cried about, rather only pornography depicting real children. 14 years later, in 2013, Japan considered criminalizing the mere possession of child pornography and whether there should be a provision for a government investigation into whether these manga cartoons or other computer-generated uh, computer images were in any way connected to the sexual abuse of real children. Artists throughout the country protested, and opponents pointed out the utter lack of scientific evidence linking fiction and real-world crime. When Japan enacted the law criminalizing mere possession in 2014, it did so without that provision. As it stands today, only pornography depicting real, actual children is illegal in Japan. Let me say it another way in plain English. In Japan today, images of fictional minors, either naked or engaged in sex acts, is a protected form of art. I think it's natural for anyone to wonder if Japan is the outlier here. Is Japan the only country protecting artwork depicting minors? In fact, quite a few countries still defend the rights of artists. Countries such as Brazil, Denmark, Finland, Germany, where I happen to live, Italy, Mexico, and Switzerland are just a few. And you'll notice that most of these are European nations. And then there are a few countries in which the issue is a little less clear. Countries like Austria, the Netherlands, Spain, and Sweden. But we're not here to consider Japanese or German law, are we? No. I think we're here to talk about the law in the United States. Well, I could literally spend an hour explaining the main laws and attendant legal cases concerning this issue within the United States. And rather than teach an online law course, I'll boil it all down to the essentials. As it stands today, 18 U.S.C. 1466A, commonly known as the 2003 Protect Act, makes it a federal crime in the United States for any person to knowingly produce, distribute, receive, or possess with intent to transfer or distribute visual representations such as drawings, cartoons, or paintings that appear to depict minors engaged in sexually explicit conduct and are deemed obscene. And do you doubt that folks are actually being prosecuted or arrested for cartoons? We could look at the case of Stephen Kutzner of Idaho. He was arrested and prosecuted for possessing pornographic pictures of characters from the TV show The Simpsons. Then we could look into the case of Joseph Audette of Surrey, Maine. He was arrested for pornographic anime. Christian B., of Monette, Missouri, was sentenced to three years of prison for possessing cartoons depicting pornography that were cartoons. And then we have Elmer Eichner III, who had his parole violated for possessing cartoon images. So yes, this is real. And therein lies the rub. The primary question here is this. By criminalizing an art form, who is intended to be protected? There are only two possibilities. Does the law intend to protect real-world children from real-world sex abuse or to protect make-believe children from make-believe sexual abuse? Let's consider them in turn. Let's consider the case of Mason, a 14-year-old cartoon boy from a small town in Idaho. I know his name because I gave it to him. And I know how old he is and where he is from because I made up those facts as well. In short, everything about this kid is made up, even his appearance. And if we're being completely honest, will acknowledge that he is not a he. This is merely an image created out of millions of electronic pixels. I can promise you no cartoon child was harmed during the making of this image. 
and no rational human being could reasonably argue that this image is going to need years of therapy to overcome the emotional damage incurred during the making of this image. But if the law was intended to protect make-believe children, how do you suggest we bring this kid into court to testify? How do you intend to arrange to bring him in for psychological counseling? Should he be paid out of a victim's assistance fund? So how about we simply agree that the American law was not intended to protect make-believe children? That leaves us with only one other possibility. That is, that the law was intended to protect real-world children. And that begs the necessary question. Is there any link between cartoon pornography and real-world sexual, sexual abuse? If it could be proven that the existence of cartoon pornography actually led to sexual abuse of real-world children, then this discussion would be over. The law would have a solid rational justification above challenge. Well, two governments took this question quite seriously. I mentioned earlier that the Japanese government had declined to criminalize cartoon pornography. There was a reason for that. The leader of the Liberal Democratic Party, and that's the name of the party, said in a statement, quote, Manga, anime, and CG child pornography don't directly violate the rights of boys or girls. It has not been scientifically validated that it even indirectly causes damage. Since it hasn't been validated, punishing people who view it would go too far. End quote. The Japanese politicians noted that statistically, sexual abuse of minors in Japan has declined since the 1960s and 1970s, while prevalence of fictional lolicon has increased. On the opposite side of the planet, the Danish government commissioned a similar study. In 2012, the sexologist clinic in Copenhagen submitted a report to the Danish government finding no evidence that cartoons and drawings depicting make-believe children encourages real-world sexual abuse. As a result, the Danish government has declined to criminalize cartoon pornography. I'm sure that you've heard the claim by activists that violent video games and films encourages teens and estranged adults to commit acts of violence in the real world. I'm going to call that theory exactly what it is. Pure nonsense. And the people who tout that theory know that it's ridiculous. Is it true that violent TV and films encourages people to commit violent crimes? Well, we all know that murder is illegal. It is a crime in every jurisdiction on this planet. Yet it is perfectly legal to watch films and TV shows depicting graphic murders in countless ways. My parents are lifelong fans of the murder mystery show Murder, She Wrote. Does that mean that my parents are murderers in the making? I have also heard it said that every person who watches cartoon child pornography is a rapist or child molester. If there is any validity to that argument, then every person who has watched Silence of the Lambs is a serial killer. Every teenager who has played Grand Theft Auto is a drug pusher and pimp. And every dark web surfer who has watched a video of an ISIS beheading is a jihadist. Yet those films, games, and videos have not been criminalized. Why not? Because the government knows that watching these things do not turn the viewers into murderers, drug pushers, pimps, or terrorists. In the same way that my playing NFL on my game box does not turn me into a professional football player, Neither does my reading the Bible turn me into Moses. We will not dispute that actual child pornography does not constitute a protected form of art. It is well within the rights of the government to ban it. However, we're not talking about actual child pornography. We're talking about cartoon pornography. It's make-believe. And that's all art is. It doesn't matter whether the image appeals to you or me or not. It does not matter whether you would hang this image on your living room wall or not. That's not how art works. Last week, I was in the local art gallery here in Stuttgart with some friends. 
As part of an exhibit, we stopped and viewed some works by the painter Pablo Picasso. In truth, I don't really care for his paintings. They don't move me. I, ju I just can't connect with them. But I have no difficulty whatsoever in acknowledging his artistry. And because I don't particularly care for this painting, do I have the standing to condemn it as pornography and demand that it be burned? As a gay man, this image does nothing for me, but I have no difficulty in acknowledging the artistry. Now, we acknowledge the potential harm to real-world children involved in the making of actual child pornography. That's not in dispute. But that's not the topic we're discussing here. In this video, we're talking about computer-generated pornography containing cartoon children. And as the studies have shown, there is no link between the possession of cartoon pornography and the actual sexual abuse of real world children. In fact, there is evidence that legalizing cartoon pornography reduces the danger posed to real world children. Therefore, no one is being protected by banning this form of art. It sounds a little crazy at first, but when you step back and think about it objectively for a moment, it makes a lot of sense. I don't care what people do in the privacy of their own homes. I really, honest to God, don't. And if some dude in the privacy of his own home would rather masturbate while looking at pictures of Lisa Simpson, I'm much happier with him doing that than looking out of his bedroom window and masturbating while watching my nieces while they swim in my pool. Finally, my problem with the, the federal American law is that it is so overbroad as to encompass works of art that are patently ridiculous. Using our new digital drawing pad, I'm going to demonstrate the ridiculousness of this legal definition. Virtually anyone can draw stick figures. Even I can do that. And that is all well and good. But the moment I flick the stylus like this, it becomes pornographic. And if I dare to imply, even with words, that this figure might be intended to represent someone under the age of 18, then my silly stick figure crosses the line into criminal depictions of child pornography. How far are we going to let these moral crusaders go in restricting our rights of free speech and expression? The last group of ultra-moralists that I can remember making such a push murdered 12 French journalists and cartoonists at a French publication for daring to draw a cartoon of the Prophet Muhammad. While the Western world fears the rise of Islamic fundamentalism, in which art and free speech are generally the first targets, the West should also fear the rise of American ultra-moralists who are making moves against any art and free speech which offends their restrictive views on human sexuality. They are intent on forcing their narrow moral views on the rest of the population through legislation. And whether you like a particular form of art or not is not the criteria for determining whether it should receive protection. There are quite a few forms of art that I don't care for and wouldn't hang on my wall or wouldn't listen to. But that doesn't mean it isn't art. And it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be protected. In this instance, there just isn't a legitimate reason for banning cartoon pornography in which there are no victims. Those folks who don't like it or don't want to see it, I'm one of them, can use their internet browsers to find something else to watch or listen to. Thank you for your attention. And I hope this gives you something to think about.